Are you tired of the government trying to calcify your pineal gland and turn you into nothing more than a working zombie? Look no further because the Houston Ensemble has now been sponsored by the amazing Epic Water Filters. Tell us what they do, Armin. Epic Water Filter is the only true filtration system you need. All these other filtration systems skip out on so many terrible chemicals and minerals that are still in your water and that you should not be drinking. Fluoride, chromium, lead, all these other things that you do not want in your water. We've got water bottles with filters on them. We've got home installation filters. We've even got pitchers. Right now you can get 20% off any of these items on epicwaterfilters.com if you use our discount code Houston Ensemble, all lowercase, one word. That's Houston Ensemble, lowercase, one word for 20% off your Epic Water Filter. Houston. All right, what's going on, everybody? Houston Ensemble, we are here with an incredible guest. Unfortunately, Chad, well, fortunately for him, he's in Vegas having a lot of fun. And unfortunately for us, he can't be here today. But we have a guest from the Houston Communist Party, and he was gracious enough to come here and talk about the organization and some of what they're trying to do around the city and abroad and here in the United States. Now, this is going to be a completely anonymous episode. He will be blurred out significantly. And this was by request of the organization, which I wanted to respect. And I think that it's going to give our guest the opportunity to speak a little more freely about what he wants to talk about. And I really do encourage uh, free discourse on this platform. That is the whole point of the Houston Ensemble. We have guests with opposing views. We have okay. guests that want to maybe even fight each other. I don't know. <laughs> but that's the idea here because if we're talking about achieving peace someday in our future as a human race, we got to start somewhere. And I think it starts at the table. So. Welcome again, sir. It's a it's an honor to have you. If we can get into a little bit about uh maybe your background as much as you want, or maybe just like why you're part of the organization. Sure. Um. So where I'm actually from, um, I'm not a Houston native. Start off, I moved here. It'll be about six six years ago already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, I've always wanted to live in a big city. You know, this mm -hmm. is great. Uh, as to why I'm here specifically, the organization, I would say, as, as melodramatic as it sounds, you know, I think this organization is, is going to be instrumental in saving the world. You know, we have catastrophes going on as we speak right now. Mm -hmm. I think for the, for the future of humanity, we have to change how things are right, right now. We saw already from both the pandemic and the winter storm, yeah. how both the state and the the, the economy mm -hmm. has has influenced both the response and the causes of what's going on right now. You know, we we've already seen what happens when the free market is in charge with this whole winter storm. So we we have to make a change somehow. We're not going to do that with either Republicans or the Democrats. Mm -hmm. It's just, those are just the facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so when we're talking about uh, these political parties not having maybe the, the power or the resources or actually the wherewithal to address certain issues like we're going through, what are some of the ideas as far as solutions you guys are thinking about and what's your perspective on that? I think first of all, the question is a uh, is wrong. I think it's not about them having the resources or mm. or the wherewithal. I think the what they lack is the will mm. of it. You know, we've already we've already inaugurated a new president. How much has changed? You know, mm -hmm. I think from last I heard, he he put back the portraits of Bush and Obama. Mm. That's about the extent that I've seen. <laughs> They've, uh, they've recently passed the COVID relief bill. They've already abandoned the 15 minimum wage. Mm -hmm. 
they abandoned the two thousand dollar checks mm -hmm. a while back. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not about the lack of resources so, so much as the lack of will. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that is because at the end of the day, both parties they prioritize short term profits right over long term strategy. Right. And for that, you know, we're not we're not going to be able to depend on them. It has to be right the working class that makes the change. Mm -hmm. When you say uh, when you say that, that really resonates with me because. When I think about even short term profits, even if it's midterm profits, you know, like we're even midterm could be 50 years, you know what I mean? It could be a whole lifetime, but like long term, we're talking about like hundreds of years, right? We're talking about like real, really thinking about the trajectory of the entire civilization, right? So, what it maybe you can tell me what that could look like in terms of policy making in terms of in the government structure like what could we do to usher that in i think we should go to star trek okay. <laughs> i think uh sure. well to start off you know i'm not i'm no policy expert i'm no uh political science major or anything i, I can't uh i can't picture for you the successful government all I know is that right now, the way things are, it has to change. Mm -hmm. And it has to change fast. Right. Way, way too fast for electoral politics to catch up. Right. You know, what I can show you is from the past, you know, all these uh, actual changes that have helped people, they didn't come from just voting stuff in. You know, they came from actual movements. Right. We're going to talk about the civil rights movements, the women's rights. Mm -hmm. All of those came from people, the working class coming together, solidarity. Mm hmm and basically demanding changes, not just right. trying to vote in the lesser evil. Right. So if I understand correctly, the interest here, at least with what you're saying, is to see how we can get the working class people to work more in tandem, you know, to have a little more cooperation with each other. And it's interesting because I recall roughly 2011, 2012, Occupy Wall Street, and uh, I went to several of those protests in L.A. because I was at USC getting my uh, bachelor's at the time. And at the time, I was very interested in the idea of kind of like what kind of happened with the Reddit guys in GameStop. Right. <laughs> you know, like those guys actually did what I think we were trying to do 10 years ago. But it didn't seem what what I found was that it didn't seem like they had the legal power the movement had the legal power and the legislative power so there's a lot of people and 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 i say this with utmost respect there's a lot of young people playing djembe and smoking pot but not a lot of people saying who do we sue who do we get into these courts how do we play this game to get something done right and, and I wonder if there's a, a strategy within the organization, unless you don't want to mention it, where we're trying to kind of think about that. Because, you know, for example, in Texas, we didn't get the proper treatment during the ice storm, right? Right. Somebody has to answer to that. And in a, in a decent court system, and I, I'm fairly confident in the U.S. court system, not always, but fairly, we should be able to talk to somebody about that in a judicial room right so if if there's anything you could share in terms of like something in, regarding policy making maybe you guys are interested in achieving well policy making uh first of all i think it's not a not an either or thing you know i don't think we should focus on just one tactic i think diversity of tactics is going to be the most efficient um you know you talk about wall street and the Wall Street protests and what recently happened in, with the GameStop, the Redditors, I think those are two different avenues that are available. You know, mm -hmm. they, have different, uh, they have different purposes. Um, yeah, I would say being able to focus on many things at once would be the best strategy to use. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be able to take advantage. I wouldn't say take advantage, but being able to use uh, the legal system effectively. Right. And being in the streets at the same time, right? Uh, first of all, because they feed off of each other. Right. There's no, uh, there's no public outcry. You know, legislators aren't going to do anything. Right. 
and vice versa. You know, if there's only public outcry, but there's no, uh, there's nothing else, you know, mm -hmm. of course they're not going to do anything either because mm -hmm. there's no, uh, there's no movement to make them. Mm -hmm. So the Wall Street protests, you know, they had the public outcry, mm -hmm. but they were just protesting against buildings. You know, they weren't actually back in the court system. Right. They're still going. And on the other side, we have the GameStop people actually gaming the system mm -hmm. to, do, to do their little project. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say, you know, being, being able to, to have the discipline, first of all, to have a plan in each, uh, each event that goes on, trying to capitalize on all these events that are going on, to both have, uh, have protests going on. Because once when, when stuff happens, obviously this is for the people. So we should be able to influence the people. To demand change, yeah, and at the same time, trying to trying to encourage also legislators to make that change to show them the way forward. Yeah, I was also thinking about just the history of the Communist Party. You know, obviously, its origins kind of began a little bit in uh, in Russia, Eastern Europe, um, with Karl Marx and the individuals that he was involved with to to fund his work, his his novels. And it eventually kind of moved further into the east, into China. And the beginnings of that, Mao Zedong was actually learning from um, earlier century literature on communists, the Communist Manifesto, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many people that he was uh, um, under the discipline of to understand the political ideologies that he would then try to apply to the country. And we saw uh, that in roughly the 50s, an effort by him to actually spread food and distribute food and resources. Unfortunately, it failed, as we know. But I wonder if we're getting closer to an age where we don't have to worry about scarcity as much as we think. So right now, everything in the capitalist system is like, well, we're competing because there isn't an infinite source of these things, right? We're competing because um, somebody wants more of the food, somebody wants more of the money, et cetera, et cetera. And if we get to a point where there is an infinite amount of food, energy, money, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but the, through the marvels of modern science that's not so ridiculous they're we're actually making fusion reactors or systems similar to fusion which just about five ten years ago we thought would probably not happen you know for another century um so there's incredible things going on um why my 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 wonder is because it seems like you you're not in a hurry to call the movement communist or put a label to it necessarily, and I could be wrong about that, but in that vein, why the Communist Party? Why why does the Communist Party of Houston why should it be the Communist Party of Houston to help bringing these movements? Uh, just for actually a little interesting tidbit, uh, communism didn't really start in in Eastern Europe so much as in the Paris Commune, which were Marx that at the time. Right. Like he wrote extensively on that. Yeah. I will say, you know, the different nations are going to have different characteristics for the communist movements. That's to why this one, the one here in Houston, would have, I believe, would have the best, uh, the best chance is uh, going into also something that you mentioned um, about unlimited resources. I think that's something. Uh, that's going to remain a fantasy. You know, the whole point of economics is making choices with, with finite resources. I will say, though, that I don't really think it's an infinite resource issue that we have so much as how it's allocated. Mm. I think even right now, we have the technology to supply everyone with their needs. Mm -hmm. I think it's just being inefficiently used because the ones that are in power are obviously going to keep it up to themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, as to why our movement, uh, I believe, is the best situated to make that change, is a uh, honestly just reading theory. It just seems like it's historically the best one to make a change for the people for the better. Okay. 
can you can you elaborate on that so what are some and this isn't even a, a contestion i'm trying to make it's more like uh what are some examples of of large populations today that are kind of like using the system more or less and having it like having it work uh, out you know well first of all my forte isn't really in foreign policy i do try to stick with uh local politics local economies local Mm -hmm. But I will say, you know, from what I've read, uh, actual countries that stick with, with communist ideologies, when compared to the U.S., obviously, you know, they're not going to be able to compete. We're a massive uh, country with near unlimited resources. You know, we get a lot of cheap resources, too, from other countries. But if you compare them to, like, the neighboring countries, say Cuba, you compare it to West Caribbean countries, you know, there is still comes out pretty Okay. Um, so. Do you think that the answer would have to be a purely kind of communistic structure? Do you think that there's any room for maybe updating, restructuring, reconsidering some of the older strategies and maybe synthesizing a few different ones? You know what I'm saying? Actually, I think, I think we can. I think that is, a, that is an alternative that is increasingly viable. You did talk about future technologies. Mm stuff that we thought was going to be far into the future is actually now very very near and in the present yeah i think when it comes to actual planned economies for example i think that's a much more a reachable goal that we mm -hmm. can have right now mm -hmm. you know, if you think about if you consider actual big corporations as nations economies you can see that those those structures themselves are very planned mm -hmm. you know if you think about amazon you think about walmart all those are planned economies. Mm -hmm. Their GDPs are almost bigger than many countries already. Mm -hmm. Nobody can say that they're not affected. Right. So that allocation of resources that's being done in real time, you know, that are being done in instantaneous moments mm -hmm. through technology, I think it's something that we could. Can... Yeah, th I, I, that's actually an interesting point. You know, if we if we take Walmart and its huge GDP, uh, and it, which is still growing. Um, and also the 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 employee benefits have significantly improved in Walmart since about two maybe one or two decades ago when they were having a lot of issues and lawsuits regarding you know very poor payments like the benefits not coming through or people getting cut out early blah 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 and so yeah if they can do that shouldn't other countries be able to do that and i think that's a great point but it seems like the incentive is different here with the incentive with walmart is that we must become a pro be a profiting company forever and ever we must do whatever we must do to make that happen but with a country you have to be a little bit less ego serving and a little bit more broad right um that's an interesting point what can we do in the hearts of the people to create this? You know, when Marx was writing the manifesto at first, I mean, one of the, the main tenets um, from the very beginning, from the very first drafts he wrote, he said there's basically going to be two outcomes in this kind of capitalistic system. There's going to be, eventually, the higher upper elite, and eventually there's going to be just the working class. And there will always be this division. So what needs to happen, and, and before I get into the question, and we saw the application of the Western, of the work done in the West, being applied to Yugoslavia, being applied to Russia. But what I n noticed is that we, we never really seem to get rid of that split. The split turned from corporations and workers to extremely powerful politicians and everybody else. How can we avoid that? I think, uh, first of all, educating the masses when it comes to actual revolutionary ideologies like communism because first of all to answer your question on that it's not so much these uh, ultra powerful politicians against against everybody else i think the politicians are first of all just face Who, mm -hmm. who's going to pay them 
it's the yeah. actual big corporations. You know, they're just a, mm. they're just the middleman. The corporation is still there, and they're still against the working class because they want to make profit. Mm. So I think what needs to be done with with the working class is to make some real changes, is to educate them first of all for the reason that, first of all, to give them hope. You know, people get uh, they get complacent first of all because they don't really see a way out, mm-hmm. and I think that's the biggest problem. And we see that. Uh, in, in today, right now, I think a big part of the reason why there's a lot of political memes is a way to cope. You know? mm-hmm. There's been a lot of uh, a lot of memes, you know, like with Ted Cruz going to Cancun and all that stuff. I think it's just a way to cope. I think it's because people are missing that uh, that political education. You would say to actually show them a way out, show them mm-hmm. the solutions to the problems that they see. Sometimes mm-hmm. problems they ignore. You know, they just see the effects. They don't really ask themselves, why does this happen mm-hmm. so much as what can I do to change them? What are some examples of like, wh- why does this happen? Like, what are some examples of that? Uh, just honestly, with recent memory, the whole, uh, the winter storm and the pandemic, you know, all this could have been, um, it could have been avoided. It could have been mitigated. I think a lot of people are excited, first of all, that the economy is opening back up, even if it comes with the added risk of, of getting sick, mm-hmm. spreading the virus even more. I think a lot of people, I, I obviously I empathize with the fact that a lot of people do want to work, but they've been stuck yeah. at home for so long. It's not really, it's both a mental health issue and the fact that people mm-hmm. are actually yeah. economically and otherwise. And I think people, some are happy that this is happening, or they're still anxious, but they still want to work because, you know, the material conditions are still there where they need money. Yeah. And people don't realize that it shouldn't have it shouldn't have happened this way. First of all, because we have so many examples, so many other different countries that actually provided for citizens. Mm-hmm. You know, when you have that, it's a lot easier to stay inside, wear masks, only come out when necessary. And I think when people don't see that, they don't see that those other alternatives. That's when they start thinking. Honestly, it, more selfishly, I would say. A lot of it for self-preservation, but it's really because they don't see any other way. It's interesting because a WHO representative, the spokesperson on the sickness going on right now uh, from the WHO, not the band, um, said himself the lockdowns are pretty much a last resort situation and we have to be very careful with them because what we might not realize we're doing is creating a lot more death and poverty just by virtue of the fact that our system cannot maintain a lockdown for your system cannot maintain a lockdown for a very long time and we're seeing this in this country we're seeing a massive spike in depression the rate of suicides massive spike uh, people popping pills just to cope. Pharmaceutical industries are doing very well right now. The billionaires have all doubled their wealth in just a few months of the, of the lockdowns. And that's preposterous, right, if you think about it. And it's also preposterous that we would have to, we have to fight for at least a minimum wage worth of, of, of money a month to do what we're told to do. And so I am, uh, like you said in the beginning, I am, I am disappointed that the minimum wage thing just left the building very quickly. The, 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 the new nearly $2 trillion stimulus is giving an obscene amount of money once again to corporations and even uh, movements that are not domestic movements that are outside the United States. So it seems like the corporatocracy is as strong as ever. And, and I wonder what kind of education is necessary for us to finally stand up. Because like my friends say, and you might agree with this, all we'd really have to do is just say no. There doesn't need to be any blood. There doesn't need to be any fighting. You sit here and be like, nah. <laughs> yeah, actually, he's, he's actually right. Um, I do find it interesting, really, that even the head of, of the WHO, the World Health Organization, 
that's pretty much taken for granted. You know that the biggest economy of the world is, is just going to let their citizens just throw them out in the open. You know? mm-hmm. uh, it's a stimulus aside and everything. You know, he did say that that we're not a that even the lockdown itself should be used as a last resort. Why? Why is that? You know. Um, of all these mental health issues which are true but it really isn't just that is it it's the fact that even they know that our economy can't take all of us just staying inside because the economy is not helped you know you've you've seen how they're much more willing to help the corporations both republicans Mm -hmm. and democrats yeah they know that the average person is going to be thrown to the pool when we look at other countries you know um they had their lockdowns, you know, they all wore masks, they all came out re- relatively unscathed from all of this, but our, our culture is being driven by this individual, individualist uh, capitalism towards uh, every man for himself, and this is where it leads, this is the culture that we've already cultivated. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, cultures are reflections of material conditions, so they, they didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. Our, our people are used to be, having to fend for themselves, mm-hmm. that the government is not going to help them. In some way, that's made us resourceful. In other ways, like in crises like these, it turns into shit show, to be honest with you. Yeah. And you're right, you know, your friend, your friend is right. I think uh, all they have to do, all the worker has to do is say no. Go on a general strike. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a nuclear option that nobody talks about, but mm-hmm. it's right there in front of us. Yeah. If the government won't work for us, why should we work for the government? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it wouldn't have to be a whole ordeal. It wouldn't have to be a dramatic ordeal. <laughs> you know, it's, it could be a lot of fun, actually, to just say no and uh, come as a unit for once. It would, I, I believe that if that were to happen, the government would basically poop bricks. <laughs> They've already shown how little they can last if there's exactly. no working. Exactly. They would just poop bricks because <laughs> what are they going to do? They can't round up 330 million Americans. They're not going to do that. And they're, they're going to be forced, finally, to address these issues. Um, sometimes on this podcast, we talk about the kind of spiritual work that needs to be done. Because I understand at the end of the day, you can make the argument that evolutionarily speaking, we got to the point we are because it was hard, not because it was easy, right? And, and I totally understand that. And I believe in that as well. Like, I believe sometimes um, you can take a lot of things for granted, right? I mean, I was born in 92 in Sochi, Russia, and 92, guess what? Guess when that right. was? That was right <laughs> after the collapse of the entire country, right? And uh, I don't want to get into the politics of that too much because Russia has its own version of the, of the story of and America has its own version. The Cold War has never ended between these two countries. Um, and now we have another superpower come into play as a part of the Cold War whatsoever or what have you. And um, so... I'm just trying to say, as bad as it was, you know, and being homeless at one point, many points, and then coming to this country, being homeless here, and trying to, I will say this, I don't want to crap on America too bad. I don't want to do that because that's not fair. At the end of the day, I'm here, I've been able to experience a lot of fantastical things. I know fantastical is not a word. Just amazing, amazing opportunities. So, just to be fair, you know, it's it's not all bad here. You know what I'm saying? Don't you think so? I mean, let's let's be clear. This place is a paradise for many people. Yeah. But uh, I think at, at what cost? You know, at the end right. of the day, uh, America has one of the bi- the biggest income and social economic equalities in the developed nation. Uh, that and the fact that how many resources do we extract from so many other countries? You know, how many deals do we make with countries that are yeah. in no other uncertain terms? You know, they're under duress. You know, how mm-hmm. many government overthrows have we? 
Oh. There's there's a reason why our economy our our economy and our country is as prosperous as it. Is. But you're right, you know, right. this country is great to live in. Right. That's an excellent point. Um the amount of econo- the number of economies we've actually destroyed and taken over so oh, that this one can exactly. So we've we've ruined people's lives. And I don't know what the the official numbers are for the death toll in just the from just the efforts in Iraq since 2003, but Over I think 200,000. Oh, I think way more than that. I think it's way more. Yeah, those are direct casualties, not even to go into actual uh, all the yeah. forced deportations and everything that had to go on. How yeah, many lives have been forced to flee. According to things that I've heard about, leaks that I've heard about, I don't know any, I just hear things. Um, the number's a little more towards a million plus. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, destroying an entire country, making an, making an excuse, right? Making an excuse that now everybody knows was a BS excuse. And there's pretty much a, like a unanimous agreement there that the, the reasons we made up to go in there were actually false. It was a false flag operation. And it'll go down in history books, just like Gulf of Tonkin went down in history books. Um, we're able to do that, and somehow the attention span of the people, it's like, why don't we care that we just did that? What is that I, phenomenon? I think it's, uh, I think Noam Chomsky, how he said it, manufacturing consent. Mm-hmm. I think it really is just that. All, uh, you mentioned these Cold Wars that we're having right now. I think it's just, we're, we're watching it happen again. We're watching mm-hmm. the, <laughs> to use the right wing term, the mainstream media is, uh, is painting pictures for us. You know, they, have, they have some of the facts. Facts can be misleading, and the commentary that they apply to it afterwards is, is a, there's a purpose to it. You know, they have goals. Because at the end of the day, you know, the me- a lot of the media is controlled by, by corporations. So they do have to toe the line, not just with them, but with the State Department. The State Department is the one that supplies them a lot of facts, and obviously they're going to take those at face value. Mm. What's so interesting is that we're seeing sort of a different version to me, to me. It looks like a different version of the Red Scare. A different version of the Red Scare. So we saw in the, in the, like the, the, the cusp of the so-called Cold War, and I apologize to our viewers if you're hearing some loud sounds. They're doing a lot of plumbing work at the house right now. Gosh, really loud. I think we'll be fine. Um, So the reason I call it a different Red Scare, and I want to be very careful in how I say this, because it's just a parallelism that I'm drawing from history. We saw politicians being smeared and destroyed within, like, days during the first Red Scare. Even if... Any, any Hollywood person, any politician that even, like, there was an inkling of a feeling that they were involved somehow, they were done. You know what I mean? And we've tried to do the same thing to a president. Now, here's the thing. The courts found nothing. Let's, let's, be, let's, be, let's talk about facts. What happened was the courts found nothing in terms of the collusion, blah, blah, blah. But it's interesting because this version of the Red Scare has been twisted. It's been twisted so that it appears as if the person in question is, must be taken down. Whereas before, it could have been anybody. It could have been a simple celebrity, whoever. So... Do you have any thoughts about this new version of what seems to be like a, 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 a fear of a, a new type of communism coming back or new type of influence from Russia coming back? What is that all about? And have you ever thought about it? 
I think, uh, first of all, it's funny that the Democrats themselves are very, uh, seeing those, uh, those memes of Moscow match and everything that it was a communist Russia who put in Trump as president. Um, yeah. But I think it's easier for the U S to, to have this culture war, this, uh, this cold war against the foreign enemy. First of all, it's a lot easier to demonize somebody that's in a country mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody that's here. Mm -hmm. Uh, while we do have some influence in, in a lot of stuff that, that, that we try to do, you know, uh, we do try to do a lot of community support, a lot of community organizing. It's not like how it was uh, much more in the open back then. Yeah. For, for whatever reason, but at the end of the day, you know, people don't see communists as, as a foreign enemy, first of all. It's a lot easier for them to, to demonize somebody like that. You know, nowadays a communist, you know, the guy down the street. Mm-hmm. Or the person you know, handing you spies during an emergency, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, people, people recognize that it's a lot harder to demonize somebody like that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to back then, a lot of them were immigrants too. Mm -hmm. A lot of the communists back then were either immigrants or they were people who, who people didn't really pay attention much. Right. Well, all the influence they had, in, first of all, in, in the civil rights movement that were going on was the stuff that people really cared about, I would say. Uh, so right now, yeah, all this uh, communist, the, the sphere of communists uh, comes mainly from other countries, I would say. And that's where our, our rage is focused. Yeah, you mentioned uh, an irony in the fear now. Uh, the irony seems to me that you know while we continue to to okay let's be clear i mean everything in our immediate vicinity was made in china okay including this microphone and the the, the flip book probably that you're using maybe even sure, so. <laughs> i'm not sure i'm not sure i'm not sure but you know um the 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 number the largest sellers on Amazon are actually Chinese companies. The largest suppliers of industrial machinery are still Chinese. So, guess what? <laughs> if we're so afraid of red, we're right in bed with them. And so this is a very so you have to you have to address that. I think. Because that goes into something else. You mentioned Chomsky. I'm going to go to Orwell real quick. The concept of double think. So we're able to simultaneously loathe any uh, amount of manipulation from Russia or even China. But we're also able to simultaneously do trillion dollar deals with these countries. See, those two things are actually mutually exclusive. They can, you can't live, like, if you did that to your friend, you know, you said, hey, uh, you know, I'll be there on time. I'll bring some food. I'll bring, I'll bring some food and I'll be there, right? You show up two hours late, you have nothing, and you eat all his food, right? That, nobody will let you get away with something like that. But we let our politicians get away with that every day. I think uh, to to quote one of our past presidents, you know, it's it's the economy stupid. The what? It's, uh, the, it's the economy stupid. The economy uh, is stupid. Bill Clinton, yeah. Uh, I think it's for the for the same reason we are able to do all these uh, multi million billion dollar deals with Saudi Arabia, and at the same time, you know, we hate Iran. Right. It's one of those things where the money is always going to talk with the U.S. It doesn't matter ideology. Right. It doesn't matter past grudges. Money always talks. With yeah. I think it's as simple as that, honestly. Yeah. And I think in the very least, probably and you would agree, what would have to happen is in the very least a recognition in the people that what they say and what they do isn't aligned. So we need to, we need to be very consistent in our judgment of these politicians. I, I, there are certain things because of people's biases that they have a leeway with, 
Like, for example, if you're a hardcore Democrat, you know, God bless you. No offense to you. Like, great. That's fine. But if we don't apply the same scrutiny to the current administration that we did the, to the last one, that, that is just weird, man. Right? Because what happens is, as soon as your side gets in, basically, you're willing to let them get away with whatever. And how are we going to make actual improvements in the system that way? So the two part, and that's really the whole purpose of the two party system, isn't it? Honestly, yeah. It's uh, I remember who who said this, but they said that the U.S. is basically a one party state with just two faces, mm -hmm. and that's honestly true. You know, uh, to be clear, Democrats are marginally better than Republicans, but it's really not by much. We talk about the migrant facilities, uh, we're going to talk about warmongering, if we're going to talk about actually helping the people. Mm -hmm. I think Biden administration has pretty much already set the tone how that's going to go down, if it ever does. Mm -hmm. We're already hearing all these excuses that are coming out, like, oh, Trump's ruined all this so much that it's going to take forever to, mm -hmm. to fix it. Well, That's code can... word for we're not fixing <laughs> it. <laughs> exactly. You know, if, you're, if you have control of the government and you don't use it, then what good are you? You know, you either you either don't have the will, or honestly, you can't do it. Then what good are you? Yeah. At least the uh, Republicans, you know, when they take charge for the evil <laughs> evil goals they have, they're very effective. Yeah, in being able to to do it, and the Democrats just really seem like like, like it's a ratchet motion. You know, one party goes one way, and they're able to click 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 mm -hmm. and the other party is just there to stop it mm -hmm. until the next time the other ones are able to go in and then it's click 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 mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. and that's how honestly we're such a right wing nation because we have one party that moves it and another party that kind of applies the slightest break on it uh -huh. so you really have to think you know what what is the difference between these parties I don't see it. Different. it's like a good call back call routine with them exactly it's exactly <laughs> what it is it's a good guy. But if I'm going to totally butcher this quote, I'm going to totally butcher this quote. And, we'll edit it. And, and, I, and we'll edit it. <laughs> and I also want uh, people to understand that we're not taking, we're not trying to take sides. I think what we're trying to do right here in this table is address some of the glaring inconsistencies in our political rhetoric and how we act as a nation and how, how we act as a people just in general. So let that be clear. So now to the quote, it is a Malcolm X quote. Um, I do have audio of this quote, which I can also include in this footage when we edit. And I will try to include this, the primary source. If anybody wants to contest the source, they are willing to do so. But the quote goes something along like this. There is no Republican or Democrat in America. There's the conservative and there's the liberal party. The conservative, they're made of wolves. They'll go to your backyard, they'll eat your chickens, and then they'll bite your head off. The liberals are the lions or the wolves in the sheep's clothing. They'll come knock at your door, they'll give you some milk, they'll be like, hey man, everything's going to be really, really nice. And then they'll set your house on fire and book it. And that was an extravagant way I put it. But basically, that's Malcolm X saying that. And I think that there's still wisdom to what he's saying to this day. Because they're really, that's the, that's the whole idea of the good cop, bad cop. The good cop is the guy that's trying to achieve exactly what the bad cop is doing. But he's acting nice. And if we, if we saw that. For what it is, I think the, the, the click would really go off in the people, and that's when the political systems will no longer be able to get away with as much as they are. I'm, a, I'm, I'm pretty sure you butchered that quote. I've seen completely it. I've seen butchered. it. I completely uh, butchered But I, I can't say it verbatim either, so yeah. I'll give you a pass on that one. <laughs> I completely butchered but, uh, <laughs> I'll include it in all the, the video. It, it yeah. was from 1963 in December at a large conference. I think there are many whites who act friendly toward Negroes. A fox acts, acts friendly toward the lamb. Mm -hmm. And usually the fox is the one who ends up with the lamb 
chop on his plate. Mm -hmm. The wolf doesn't act friendly, and therefore the <coughs> wolf has more difficulty in getting the lamb chop in his plate. I'd like to point out, though, that... And I, I, I say that because it is usually the, if you study the structure of the Negro community, mm -hmm. economically, politically, civically, psychologically, and otherwise, it's controlled by the white liberal, mm -hmm. who usually poses as the friend of the Negro, who actually differs from the white conservative in, in the same way that the fox differs from the wolf. Uh, their appetite is the same. Mm -hmm. Their motives are the same. It's only their mannerisms and, and methods that differ. Mm -hmm. so I'll include that. Oh, there you go. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, you know, you're right. You know, the, the good cop, bad cop is basically what he was talking about. And I think uh, one of our goals as, as, a, as a party, as an organization, is to make that clear. The fact that you can't just depend on electoral politics. Yeah. The fact that these two parties are just... One side is attacking you, and the other side is saying he can stop them as long as you, get, as long as you give them what they want. Basically. It. Right. And, uh, you know, like you said, once we have a class solidarity, either by doing general strikes, doing something, being, being there as a community together, that's how you can make changes. But you can't yeah. just depend on, you know, well, for this candidate, this candidate is going to make a difference. Well, for this other candidate, yeah. he's going to stop that other candidate. No. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm really, I want to make it clear, I'm really not interested in the bipartisan debate. I'm not interested in the dualistic debate. Because if we, if we recognize that the two-party system is inherently ineffective, then we must also, in discussion, avoid getting into that. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a. That's the trap. Dog, dog and pony show, yeah. Yeah, dog and pony show, exactly. It's so popular for people that like watching politics. Exactly, and and this this table is not for so popular. <laughs> okay, this table, it might the some of the things we're saying might make some Republicans uncomfortable, might make some Democrats uncomfortable, but again, we have to eliminate the soap opera, we have to eliminate the pony show. Um, I'm going to quote you on that next time. So, <laughs> what else can we talk about a little more specific to the organization? Is there anything coming up that's public, maybe, that people can get involved with? Uh, first of all, we have a socialist reading group that's one of, uh, I think it's the oldest one in Texas. It's been going on since 1988, uninterrupted. Mm. Uh, we'll be doing one on Angela Davis tomorrow, uh, Women, Race, and Class. It's tomorrow at 7. Uh, you can see it on our Facebook page. You know, just look us up. We're also on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you know, they're, they're, good, uh, they're good classes. It's on actually analyzing all these books that we try to cover as much as we can. Either stuff that's from back then, you know, all the fundamental theories. And we try to keep a lot of... Uh, a lot of current stuff that goes on too. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were here talking about Walmart. Last last book we did was on planned economies from a very recent book. Mm. Yeah, and we also have monthly meetings. It's the last uh, last Sunday of every month. So just uh, you know, you guys look us up on Facebook. Okay. You'll be able to see all the events that are going on. So yeah, also just real quick, these mm -hmm. uh, the monthly meetings especially are very interesting. You know, we have a lot of speakers that are that speak in there. A lot of information, especially on upcoming events, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's very fun. Have you ever been, uh, I'm just curious, uh, where else in uh, maybe the U.S. or the world have you visited? Oh, uh, um, I kind of cheat on that one because uh -huh. uh, my dad was a truck driver, so obviously I would go with him a lot. Uh -huh. I was a truck driver for a few years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I've really been all over the U.S. as well. Yeah. Um, as for other countries, well, uh, yeah, so I was in the military. Oh. Yeah, so I got to go to a few other countries as well. How does how does it compare? What did, what did you what, what were your thoughts when you were, for example, number one going through the United States, right? Compared to Texas, you know, what are some differences out there? I think uh, there's a lot of these cosmetic differences. You know, there's not <laughs> obviously you're not going to see Texas flags over there. There's no Texas pride. You know, they have their own uh, their own spins on stuff. Uh, I will say that there was a lot more similarity, both uh, in different cities and, and states, 
as well as other countries, you know. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, there's going to be working class people and there's going to be touristy areas. I'll, that's basically all I have to say, you know. All these people are a lot more similar to us than anything. Yep. Maybe that decreased my Texas pride a little, but uh-huh. it just seemed that we're all the same human race. Right. We're all going through the same struggles, which was the most uh, poignant part. Definitely. Definitely. I know you said you're not really a policymaker necessarily, but are there any comments you can make in terms of maybe a five-year, 10-year plan or 20-year plan? What would you like to see change just in your own community? My own community? Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of, uh, obviously we have a lot of issues when it comes to food insecurity, when it comes to homelessness. Mm Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things, really, that I was talking about when I see that. There's a lot of similarities between us and so many other parts of the country, so many different other countries. The fact that all these problems still persist, even with all the technology we have, even with all the technological advances that we've done at the end of the day, what are they for, you know? Mm-hmm. But we still have all these people that need, need they're just the basic stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. These aren't people that are asking for iPhones or anything. Mm-hmm. They're asking for a roof over the head. That's short term. That's where I would change. Mm-hmm. I will get these people help. I will get a. I don't think it's as simple as you know just raising taxes on the rich. I think it has to be something more, more fundamental than that. Yeah, I can, I can give you specific policies, but that's the stuff that we need to change first. Okay. Well. Any closing comments for the people? <laughs> you want the communist party, guys? <laughs> yeah, there you go. You heard if, you're, if, you're not, if you're not up to that, at least, you know, help your neighbors. Yeah. Get in contact with your communities. Help yeah. each other out. Class solidarity is the thing that's going to get us out of here. Speaking of which, I actually heard um, from the first person I spoke to on the phone um from the organization that you guys got a donation i i want to say f- from vietnam yeah uh, we got masks from vietnam wow. you know they're a uh, triple layered they're actually very effective you know i've actually tried one of them they're very good uh, a lot more comfortable than even this wow uh yeah we got we got a few shipments uh we are handing them out uh, i think she mentioned that she was going to give you some uh, get in contact with her this week she also uh, yeah, she wrote it down for me to tell you oh, I, I almost forgot yeah, so it's good that you mentioned that. So anything this, else you wrote out, like I wish I could tell you, man, but honestly, my handwriting is terrible. Uh-huh. So I can't even understand. <laughs> no, but uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff we we try to do as much as we can. Okay. Uh, obviously, with the whole pandemic, it's it's a lot harder to to be on on picket lines, you know, to do all these kinds of protests and stuff. We used to take part in them, but obviously, right now it's hard to do. Yeah. But we try to do as much as we can. But if we can't do that. You know, we're still trying to help our communities, mm-hmm. uh, giving out food to people, trying to help people. But uh, with this recent winter storm, uh, with the pandemic, obviously we got shipments from other countries to help us out. Yeah. And we do hand them out. Um, so yeah, you know, just get in contact with her. I'll, okay. I'll let her know too. Are you able to divulge in any of the international kind of partnerships you guys have or anything like that? Like what, if you can talk about a little bit about how the Vietnam partnership started? Uh, honestly, man, I, w- I wish I could, but honestly, I don't, I don't really know uh, much okay. about that. I know we do have a, we do keep in contact with a lot of few other countries. Mm-hmm. But other than that, you know, I, I try to stick as much as we can with just helping a local community. Okay, so what is like a day in, I don't know why we didn't ask this question, but I need to know, like, you go to the headquarters, wherever that is. What does a typical day at the organization look like for you? Well, we usually when I go to the headquarters, and this was back then, obviously, from the pandemic, it was mm-hmm. usually for a monthly meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we'll go in there, you know, there'd be speakers going on. It's almost, a, I don't want to sound blasphemous here, but mm-hmm. it's almost like a church service. Mm-hmm. You know, you have speakers going on, you have food, you have drinks. Uh, usually after the meetings, you go eat, eat, a, eat at a restaurant with everybody else. Mm-hmm. It's a very good, good feeling because you get to see a lot of people from different sides of the communities, you know, mm-hmm. uh, people from unions, people from me education a lot of different industries that are there that are being represented a lot of diversity um 
Like for me, I'm from the healthcare industry. Mm-hmm. All, it, was, it was pretty fun to attend. Wow. Now we do it through Zoom meetings, but honestly, it's still great to see a lot of, a lot of these people mm-hmm. still invested in it. That's awesome. All right. Well, guys, this has been another amazing episode. Everyone, please share the word, spread the word, share with all your friends and family, like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe. That's the only way we get to do what we do because we're trying to make this, once again, a platform, a renaissance platform for improving people's attitude, getting free discourse no matter what. I wish maybe we could have touched a little bit on the topic of censorship. That is a little thing that really irks me that we're getting into becoming more and more censored where what is being told to be censored is coming top down. But that's the whole point here is that we can't have these kinds of discussions if we get there, if it gets to that point. So that's so important for you guys to take a second, just a literal second, and kick that little subscribe button. And we will link all the stuff about the organization in the description as well. And we'll see you guys on another episode. Later. <laughs>